It's 9.10 in the morning and we're rolling down runway 15 in our King Air. 9.10 and 34 seconds, we lift off. 36, 37, 38, and something happens. I say, what in the world? Stall horn goes off, turning left. Copilot says, I've just lost left engine. 45, 46, I say nothing. Bank angle warning, 48. Copilot exclaims, bank angle warning, impact. 9.10 and 51 seconds, it's over, that fast. A beautiful King Air 350 crashed on takeoff in Addison, Texas, tragically killing 10 people. The NTSB docket is out. Let's go through it and see what we can do to prevent such tragedies in the future in this episode of Taking Off. Hello, welcome to Taking Off. I'm Dan Milliken, and first off, I'd like to thank all our subscribers. We hit the 25,000 mark this week. We really appreciate you. And I do more celebration talk, but the topic of this video is just too serious and sobering, so let's get to it. An airplane crashes, and everyone rushes to judgment and conclusions. In the days after a tragedy, armchair pilots and the Facebook experts blame the plane, the pilot, the controllers, and then the next big news hits and the tragic story is relegated to the back burner while the NTSB finally gets down to work. Yes, they take a really long time, a year to 18 months, but when they post their findings, you can bet that the conclusions won't get the same kind of press as the recency of a crash gets. But now, is the time to learn. Now is the time to take what happened and adjust our own behaviors, our processes, and equipment. Adjust based on evidence and not speculation. And to be transparent with you, I debated not doing this video. I, I don't want to build a channel on the tragedy of others. It's not what this is about. But in the end, there's some very important takeaways that'll make me a better pilot and a better person, and maybe hopefully you too. And it's because of that I'm making this video. When an airplane crashes, the standard procedure is for the NTSB to investigate. The timeline usually involves a preliminary report a week or two after the accident. Then when the investigation is complete, usually 12 to 18 months later, the NTSB makes the docket, and that's all the information they've collected, public. Then after that, the NTSB will make a ruling on the probable cause or factors for the accident. With that in mind, I want to turn to the horrible crash in Addison, Texas on June 20th, 2019. The NTSB has recently released the docket, and that's what we're going to summarize. And I said summarize. I'm not going to speculate. This accident is in my own backyard. I've flown in and out of Addison. I've got friends who work out of Addison. Addison is located right next to Dallas Love Field and is one of the busier feeder airports in the country. A lot of executive aviation travel is based at Addison. And as a pilot, quite frankly, Addison scares me a little, or at least sobers me. When I fly, I like to look and see what my escape plans would be for an emergency. Where am I going to land if I have an engine out? For Addison, there's not really any good options. It's packed in a densely populated area. No real good choices during that red zone of takeoff to the point I could successfully turn back and land if I had a problem. But on June 20th, 2019, it wasn't a single engine airplane that crashed with an engine problem. It was a twin engine, a Beechcraft King Air 350, incredible plane, can be flown single pilot. It's used for a lot of purposes, the primary being executive travel, but it's used for everything from military to air ambulances. It's not a jet, it's a turboprop, so it's a little less expensive to own and operate than say a Citation or a Gulfstream and it's more reliable than a piston aircraft. For my non-pilot friends, think of it this way. Start with the smallest basic airplane. It's got a piston engine, like a car, with a cylinder, spark plugs, and combustion, and parts are hitting each other hundreds of times a second. It's a very violent mechanical process, prone to breakdowns. Then you move up to a twin piston, and now you have two of these violent mechanical beasts in the event you lose one of them. And then next up comes the turboprop. Now, it takes a jet engine working in reverse with much less violence in its operation, using the jet to turn the prop. Single engine turboprops include the Piper Meridian and the Pilatus PC-12 great planes. The most common turboprop engine is the Pratt & Whitney PT-6. It's solid and reliable. The King Air is powered by two of these Pratt & Whitney PT-6 
turboprop engines. And just because it's great and reliable doesn't mean there won't be any problems. Stuff happens. And it happened on June 20th, 2019. The NTSB has released their docket with all their investigation open to the public. Here's the facts. November 534 Foxtrot Foxtrot, a King Air 350, fairly new, only two years old, was taking the eight people, the owner and some friends, and two pilots down to St. Pete's for pleasure. The plane could seat 11, by the way. And it wasn't a charter. No one was paying for their seat on the airplane, so it was operated under the FAA rules and guidelines known as Part 91. The two pilots did a walk around. The co-pilot greeted the passengers and loaded the luggage. They got in the plane and took off from runway 15 at Addison. 17 seconds after liftoff, the plane impacted a hangar. 17 seconds. So, all right. Diving into the NTSB docket and their investigation, here's what they found. And we'll start at the beginning. And I'll summarize and go quickly or this video will become way too long. You've got the pilot. He's a 71-year-old male with over 16,000 total hours and 1,100 in the King Air 300 series. And the co-pilot, in his 20s, recently married with over 2,300 hours total, and his King Air time was in a smaller version of the airplane. Some people jumped on that, but remember, this plane is a single pilot plane. Often pilots will have someone come along as a co-pilot or second in command to assist them. The co-pilot's hours in this case are inconsequential. He wasn't flying the plane. In interviews with the NTSB, it was reported that the pilot wasn't comfortable flying alone, so he would take a second pilot with him. But to clarify, by the evidence, the pilot was the one flying and manipulating the controls, not the co-pilot. The pilot was up to date on certificates, training, and ratings. So they arrived and did a walk around of the aircraft. The pilot went into the cockpit, the plane's cockpit voice recorder, CVR, has an unknown voice telling the pilot that there was a burn issue with oil in engine number one, the left engine, and to keep an eye on it. And when you read through the docket, there's some investigation into this. Four days prior, a mechanic read very low oil levels and put some in. But in the cockpit, the voice tells the pilot there's no oil blow, no leakage. What he was saying is that if the engine was losing oil, there was no evidence of that. The oil consumption on the left engine, it was a focus for the NTSB report. But now the turbojet is not a piston engine. Oil is like blood to a piston. It flows throughout just about on everything. And that's not the case with the PT-6. Sure, it requires oil, but has fewer moving parts, less oil consumption. Back to the narrative. Then the pilot in the cockpit talked to Jeppesen to work out a problem with the activation key for some GPS software in the cockpit, which went unresolved. The co-pilot was outside the plane loading the luggage, which leads to weight and balance. There is no evidence that the pilot or the co-pilot weighed any luggage or did a weight and balance. Interviews with witnesses reveal that the pilot did not perform weight and balance on planes he regularly flew. Now, to be fair, do I do a weight and balance every time I take Lola up? No, I don't. And for those of us who fly a lot or fly routinely in our planes, complacency is real. In the NTSB report, estimating the weight, the plane was 660 pounds over takeoff weight. And that's 4.4% over. My opinion, that's not a lot, but it could certainly be a contributing factor. The balance was pretty close to the aft maximum, but was inside the limits. So everyone got loaded up and the doors were closed. Another item mentioned in the report was how fast the crew got the plane from startup to takeoff. To properly go through each checklist item, experts testify it can take as much as 15 minutes. This crew from engine start to announcing ready for takeoff was six minutes. Takeoff started that morning at 9.10 and 12 seconds. The plane lifted off the runway at 9.10, 34 seconds. What can be heard on the CVR is the two props turning at the same tone. Exactly five seconds later after takeoff, something happened. A change in the tone of the propellers and a click can be heard. Change in the prop tone and an audible click. Remember that. We'll come back to the NTSB focus on this possible issue. And let's pause right here. The NTSB, a few days after the accident, held a press conference where they announced confusion in the cockpit on the voice recorder. Well, I've read the transcript and it's very simple. A click, 
and the propellers changing tone five seconds after liftoff, and the pilot exclaimed, what in the world? Sure, he was confused as anyone would be. And one second later, the stall horn sounded. Two seconds after that, the co-pilot says, you've just lost your left engine. Five seconds after that, bank angle warning sounds, immediately followed by the co-pilot making an exclamation in a second and a half later, impact. That was very fast. A total of 12 seconds from start of problem to impact. 17 seconds after the tires had left the ground. Okay, let's cover some findings in the NTSB report that are significant. The oil consumption on the left engine. But no evidence of oil leakage was observed by any witnesses. The NTSB spent some time investigating the training. Both pilots had gone through recurrent training required by the FAA. And this training includes practicing engine out procedures. Because of the inherent danger, the procedure is not practiced during an actual takeoff. And speaking of training, what is the procedure for an engine out on takeoff, after liftoff, but before gear has been retracted? Physically, if a twin engine aircraft experiences loss of thrust in one engine, obviously there's an immediate out of balance issue. The other side pushes the plane and the drag from the affected engine can increase the rotation. And in addition to the push, the good engine wants to climb, resulting in a bank attitude. So it looks like this. Engine experiences loss of thrust. The drag combined with the thrust from the other side results in a turn and bank that must be dealt with immediately, especially close to the ground. So what is the procedure used in training to deal with this situation? My friend Martin Polly did a video about this very thing when he went to train for his multi. Here's his clip. So let's talk about the drill. And we are going to beat this into your brain at the same place in your brain where Mary had a little lamb exist. And the drill goes like this. Here, write this down. If we write, we remember better. Okay. Pitch for blue line, mixtures, props, throttles, flaps, gear, identify, verify, feather, mixture, engine failure checklist. So what is the drill for the King Air 350? I talked to some King Air 300 series pilots and everyone points to a guy named Tom Clements. And maybe we can have Tom on the show sometime soon. In an article, and I'll put the link in the description below, Tom talks about the drill specifically for King Airs and it's a mantra. Power, props, flaps, and gear. Then identify, verify, feather. In this particular accident, the pilot, upon loss of thrust, would check power. And if the power lever had migrated back on its own, returning it corrects the problem. And we'll talk about power lever, lever migration in a moment. And if the engine has failed, procedure with runway in front of you and gear still down is to cut the power and land immediately. Sure, with the loss of thrust on one side, the airplane yaws, but the pilot needs to hit that right rudder, pull the power back, and when the power is cut, the airplane is in balance again. Both engines are not giving any thrust and the rudder can be eased. In this case, what is clear is that if there was a power lever migration on the left engine, it was not observed vocally by the pilot or the co-pilot. And if it was an engine problem, the pilot did not choose to set it back down on the runway. And the second part of the drill is props. And what this means is that the bad engine is feathered, which turns the blades to decrease drag, so you don't have to mash the rudder so hard. An interesting note about the King Air 300 series, it's equipped with an auto feather and rudder boost. These are buttons that are activated during start on the checklist. The NTSB report cannot determine if either of these buttons were activated. Regardless, in a power lever migration, the auto feather becomes disabled. Which takes us to another item in the investigation, the lack of evidence of checklist use. There is no evidence that the pilots used the checklist at any point in the pre-flight and the takeoff. The pilot could have gone through the checklist silently, we don't know. Witnesses describe the pilot as someone who didn't use checklists. And why is this important? Did he miss something because of not using the checklist? Well, that's hard to say. He didn't brief the passengers as required by the FAA, but that's not a contributing factor. The checklist for the airplane does include a check for the throttle lock, the auto feather, and the rudder boost we talked about before. But there was no pre-takeoff briefing with the pilots, no briefing on what to do if they have a failure on takeoff. 
The investigation also focused on whether the pilot flew with two hands on the yoke. All acquaintances that had flown with the pilot report that he would take off with both hands on the yoke or that they couldn't recall. And why is this important? There is a known issue with the King Air where there's something they call power lever migration, where the power lever rolls back down if you haven't locked it. And some pilots will have the co-pilot guard the throttle to make sure it doesn't migrate back. And also one acquaintance reported that the pilot had an aggressive rotation technique and would pull up abruptly. Another item on the investigation, one person reported that the pilot was experiencing a painful right ankle condition that might have contributed to the problem since a left engine loss requires a very aggressive stomp on the right rudder. In this case, it was not sufficient right rudder, whether the pilot couldn't mash it or didn't have the rudder boost or the co-pilot didn't help. We won't ever know for sure. Sometime in the near future, next up for the NTSB is for them to publish their conclusions, probable cause or causes, and contributing factors. And reading through the left engine and prop documents, I'm not an engineer, so I couldn't determine if the left engine had failed or if it was simply a power lever migration that wasn't caught. I'm sure the NTSB will let us know. For the twin engine pilots out there, remember, power, prop, flaps, gear, then identify, verify, and feather. Tom Clements, in the article I referenced earlier, makes a really good point. He wishes the term engine failure would re be replaced with suspected power loss. Sure, the engine might have failed, but until you identify, the fix might be something really simple, like the migration of a power lever. Martin's instructor, Doug Rosendahl, made a couple of good points about how to avoid these tragic situations. Everybody says, uh, we'll rise to the occasion. Okay, pilots do not rise to the occasion. They sink to the highest level of their recent training. And the longer ago that training was, the lower that level's gonna be because flying is a perishable skill. So ritual makes sense out of chaos. And an engine failure in a light twin unexpected is chaos. There is the cone of confusion helmet fire, whatever word you choose to use when it actually happens. And if you can throw in a piston coming through a cowling or a little fire out there just for good measure, it's really, you know, chaos. I don't know about you, but when reading an NTSB investigation it changes me as a pilot. Yes, thoughts have occurred to me in the cockpit of what they'd write if something happened while I fly. Did I skip a checklist, which resulted in the fatal error? Were my documents all up to date and in order? What would my instructors report in an interview with an NTSB investigator? Or worse yet, what will the footage reveal from all the cameras I stick everywhere? That I wasn't precise? That I was a cowboy flying by the seat of my pants? Look, I pay attention to more details after studying crashes like this. It makes me a better pilot. What would an investigation say about you? Anti-authority? Complacency driven by, it'll never happen to me, get their itis. Hey, I'm guilty. So far, judgment hasn't been harsh in my case. So I take the lessons learned and humble myself and know my weaknesses and commit to being better, being precise, improving, learning. I hope you do too. Stay safe and remember, superior judgment trumps superior skills every time. Thank you.